Welcome back, everyone, to episode 6 of us playing as the good old United Kingdom. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, or Mr. Mr. A British Lover, but a dead end, and Fitzroy McLean, stared at the walls of Hermitage Castle. As around him, he heard the hustle and bustle of the collaborators come preparing to transport him down to London. The mutterings he overheard as he'd been transported into the castle, some have been gloating about his capture and how they look forward to hearing him hung like a traitor scum he is, and that he'd been mainly from the BFC guard guarding him. Some of the others have been whispered of regret of understanding and of hate, but it was down. There was nothing he could do now but wait, wait for his jailers to open his cell door and drag himself. He had long, had since accepted his death, he had fought from Yugoslavia to his own homeland. Death was as natural to a soldier as breathing. Though perhaps the manner of death was ironic, a British patriot loyal to the Queen of Country, executed for treason, he leant backwards and stared down to the floor. His death was determined now for better or for worse. As such, he picked up the sudden flash of white that slipped under the door with ease. Darting forwards, he grabbed the slip of paper and unwrapped it. Two things lay with him, one capsule that he knew well enough, the other a word. As McLean bit through the capsule, his last thoughts were of his men, of his nation. He'd done his best, only history would tell that was enough. Tearing the note to shreds with his last bits of strength, Victor McLean peacefully closed his eyes, knowing the single word on it meant its author would continue to his work. Shunjin. Selling forth. It was an often while posted large gatherings at his own estate, far lay wallop, but... Tonight was an exception, for tonight his candidacy for leadership of the British People's Party would become official. Seated before him were his closest supporters and oldest friends, ministers from the Bedford and Chesterton years, old guard loyalists supporting Donville's true heir, and of course his own personal circle of devotees to his own vision for revitalized England. My lords, ladies and dear friends, said Lord Portsmouth, tapping the side of his glass with a knife and standing up to address the room as waiters collected their now empty plates. This evening we embark upon a quest of the highest significance. We raise a shield to defend our beloved England from the machinations of our enemies and the dangerously misguided beliefs of some within our own party. He paused, making eye contact with Chesterton and Bedford before continuing, both with a clear approval on their faces. With the memory of our own martyr Prime Minister moving our hearts, and loyalty to crown and country invigorating our spirits, we shall march to war, we shall defeat them in the Parliament and defeat them in the party. And our prize will be 10 Downing Street once more. My lords and ladies, my campaign for leadership of the British People's Party has begun. A loud cheer filled the room as all present erupted into great applause, their joy preserved even longer by the prompt arrival of a vast array of desserts and delicacies from the kitchens. Looking around and seeing the combined influence of all the men and women in this room, Wallop couldn't help but feel confidence surging within his bones. He was going to win this. However, at the opposite end of the table, an argument was breaking up between Chesterton and Gardner. Whilst mercifully ended by the quick diversion of Bedford onto a more mutually agreeable topic, the dispute lingered in Wallop's mind and posed a still unanswered question to him. If he won, what would his Britain look like? As we were still doing into the fields. And if you want to read about stealing tra trawlers again, please go right ahead. But we are doing rashing as we read last time, too. And I got some comments to do as well. Homes we don't. It felt like as if it had been an eternity since. Ben had seen his own home. Yet as he looked over the small home he had spent his youth in, it looked like he had been left unscarred by the horrors of their uprising, except the roof. There was a lot of toll in it that's certainly not been there last time he had checked. Clutching his rucksack, he approached the front door, hearing people chatting with each other inside. It must have been a family get together. He was lucky that their unit was to be stationed in Birmingham for the next few months before they went back to camp. He needed to know how everyone was alright. He knocked three times and he heard what sounded like his mother approaching. I'll get it, she said, and this door swung open. Hello, Mom, Ben said, not quite knowing what else to say. In the brief moments before she recognized her son, Ben's mother looked weary, a strange smile on her face. It was clear she was trying to pay a lay, the dutiful hostess for whoever had come over, but when she saw her son, the facade dropped, alongside her jaw. She nervously approached, reaching her arm out. Ben, she asked, caressing his cheek, he smiled, feeling tears starting to swell up. In an instant, her arms wrapped around her torso. Uh, she began to sob into his chest, and all those days on the battlefield couldn't have been hardened in him enough for this against. Uh, for against this. Or against this, yeah. That's me, Mom, he said, hugging you in return. I made it back. The last stand of the union. Jack Jones. Heard the slamming on the bar doors of the mine echoing throughout the mine. He stroked his rifle and stared towards the tunnel entrance. He was trapped. The only exit was one that the fascists were breaking down as he thought. This was the end of the line for him. Thirty years of fighting, thirty years of fighting for the British workers to be free, and here in a forgotten, long forgotten mine in the north of Wales, he could make his final stand. The old Lee Enfield, he wielded rose to his shoulder with ease, while the browning high point in his hip maintained its reassuring weight. The sudden cry of victory from the door brought a macabre grin to his face. Then had come, for better or for worse, he heard the fascist soldiers storming down the mine, their footfalls echoing in the confined space. The first soldier didn't even see the rifle that took his life. The bullet slamming him, or slamming him the face as he turned the corner down the right side uh, of Jones' rifles. His corpse fell backwards, collapsing into the roughly human wall around him, leaving a streak of blood along the wall. The next soldier stumbled over the corpse of his friend, the bullet catching him through the neck instead of the chest where Jones had aimed. Four more soldiers died before one, uh, the Lee Enfield lay empty. That was enough time for three fascists to establish covering fire for the rest of the comrades. Jones abandoned his position without a fight and dived behind one of the crates that lay in the cave he'd been hiding in for the past week. While wow, the crate containing the rifles was on the other side of the room, that wasn't what he was looking for. One last carefully hoarded grenades uh, were in the crate he was crushing them. Reaching in, he grabbed one and slipped it into his pocket. The first fascist to creep into the room had his head blown off for his trouble. 
Next, he sprayed his, uh, his position with bullets, but the crate held fast. Jones pulled out three more shots. He threw the now empty pistol at the next fascist to enter before he rose from his crouch. A crouch and stared at the door of the unpinned grenade clutch in his hand. The last sound echoed through the mines. The red flag at full bore. A shrouded off our martyr dead. Not bad. Rebuild the roads, of course. The roads are vital for the maintenance of any modern society. They provide conduits for easy transportation of goods and food. And are vital for projection, power projection besides. Yet, roads are, it must be rather said, rather prone to being damaged in the course of war. Bombs render them usable, unusable by vehicles. Mines can render entire swaths of them dangerous. Therefore, government will need to begin a commission to analyze exactly which roads are damaged and to what extent to get the main arteries to travel back up and running. We have the labor for sure, plenty of men without work these days, but they'll need to be directed, and that is a job for our commission to do. Some of the work will, will be likely be shoddy, but there are sacrifices and everything, and this is real no exception. Sweet, sweet victory. For all we're, for all jolly good fellows, we're all jolly good fellows, for all, we're all jolly good fellows, and so says all of us. And so says all of us, and so says all of us. Once more, there was a singing echoing throughout the local pub, although this sound was not the boys who just left the school causing ruckus. This sound was men, soldiers who fought and killed and been uh, through hell for the country. And along the way, they become brothers. Ben cheerfully clapped Adolf on the shoulders as they went up to the bar. It was a younger man this time. Poor old Michael had been killed in the uprising. Hello there. What can I get you? He asked. Yeah, I would like to order uh, two pence on me, Adolf said. As Jackson received a slightly odd stare from the barman, but he went ahead and making the drinks without a word. Um... That had happened once or twice with the local, other local patrons that night, but neither man had the time nor energy to comment on it, as far as Ben was concerned. Adolf was his closest friend, and it always would be. Uh, thanking their drinks, we went back to the crowd of former soldiers. Almost all of them had come from this part of the city. The newcomers were rapidly getting used to the climate. They were all drinking, talking, and swapping war stories. Ben sat down, joining in as Dicky began an antidote of what happened when they stole their officer's cap and wore it into battle. Oh boy. Later that night, the mood grew more somber as the men remembered their friends who had not made it. Steve, Doug, Martin, Chris. A toast was made to their fallen comrades into a better future, and in honor, their honor, they got straight back to celebrations. To the winner goes the spoils. As we do have a cup of nice white tea here, to drink. Another war, another Britain. Oh, we got a lot of reader. Um, it would help if we increase our credit rating as well, too. Uh, the last time Mary had seen a ration car was only a few years ago in the early days of the Chesterton Ministry. When the food rationing from the Second World War finally came to an end, ironic, she thought, that she should be standing here rationing Cupid in hand, coupon in hand, under the remnants of the now his dead successors. Let me have a look at those, said the grocer, taking Mary's selection of coupons and checking them carefully for any sign of forgery. That was another thing that had a return of full swing from the last war, she thought, the black market. Satisfied with their legitimacy, the grocer stuffed the coupons in his pocket and began to rummage through the grouping of crates at his feet, picking out the precise amount of food as dictated by the rations. One by one, memories of waiting patiently for her mother to return with the shopping as home guard and ARP wardens kept watch came trickling back, but well, well, that was another war, another Britain. Looking to the side, she was reminded just how much Britain had changed. Instead of home guard and police keeping a reassuring eye on things, there was instead a gang of BFC thugs looking in the corners and the police clutching their firearms with a wary look in their eyes. And if all that wasn't enough, the swastika flying high from the town hall were purposed into a German H or a garrison HQ, and yet to be returned, reminded everyone whose boot their necks rested under. There you are, ma'am. Good day to you, the grocer said, handing over Mary's shopping and snapping her out of her reverie. Accepting the bag with a simple thank you, she began the long walk back home, left alone with her thoughts and fears for the future. All she could hope for was now that things recovered and got back to normal, or whatever normal passed for these days, and an end to the horrors that haunted her sleep every night. All she wanted was peace, a new life. The waves gently lapped at the side of the boat as sunlight began to break through the clouds, as on the smaller side. Only able to carry around 20 people at a time, but it served its purpose of ferrying away for refugees from Britain. Emma felt the salty tang of the air on her tongue, huddling herself into the blanket draped over her shoulders. Her exit from her home had not been a smooth one. She had been rushed onto the boat in the dead of night by old Bill, alongside the other passengers. Gunfire echoing in the background. It was possible that the old man could have caught another boat, she supposed. Perhaps they would meet again one day. A child on the other side of the boat began crying, his mother desperately trying to comfort him. Emma didn't know any of their stories, although she had gleaned from the scant conversation that had been made that everyone on the boat was affiliated with the resistance in some way or another. A fine lot they must have looked like, big draggled, bereft, and defeated. If Elizabeth was here, she would have had something comforting to say. She would have been chirping about all the possibilities that the new life opened up for them. How they could live together far away from the burdens of their old one, or maybe she could have alleviated the bitingly cold sea air by holding her, getting lost in her arms, but that was not to be, suddenly. A large dark silhouette could be seen in the distance. Everyone on the boat immediately perked up as they drew close to became clear what the figure was. It was a Statue of Liberty. They arrived in New York. Um, a muted election could be heard across the boat. Most were too drandy or to get too physical. Um, <clears throat> Emma smiled, taking out a wrinkled photo. It was one they had taken just before the uprising had begun, where they were still hiding in the attic of that old factory. Lizzie's grayscale face smiled back at her. Alongside all the other comrades, she knew they were no longer with her. Emma held the photo to her chest, whispering softly, We made it, love. Ah. The inevitable bullet. Maxwell Knight limped uh, through each hallway, followed by the few soldiers left of the resistance. 
The soldier in front of the knife barged through each door uh, as a courtesy for its leader. The former head of the MI5 panned harder than he had ever before. He recognized the hallways from decades ago, hoping the man in front of him did as well. Both became fr frantically searching the facility as it quickly became a maze. Where in the stupid crap are Where is this bunker? His eyes darted across each quarter. Still with his limp dragging him down, where is it? Perhaps I can find a supply closet. But surely they would find me, right? He thought again. It's too late to survive them. I just need to outlast them. After getting through a few more doors and dodging the inevitable bullets that rang through each hall, he found it. Supply closet. Now he weaved himself away from the colonel that led him, slamming against the door and desperately gripping the door knob. He pulled. It would have budge. He shouted a curse and tried again, pressing his door as hard as the old knight could. Nothing. The knight shuffled around through the belt of a fallen comrade at his feet, trying to find a combat knife. Accidentally scratching his finger on the blade, he scrambled to chop off the hinges. He froze after uh, hearing another gunshot, followed by what sounded like thousands of screaming, then more. His panting started to grow faster. Knight turned his attention back to the door. He had destroyed the internal workings of the lock, sinking his way into the room. The screams grew louder and the gunshots grew faster. Minutes passed. Now, Knight heard boots slamming against the metal floor and Englishmen shouting. Knight could now feel sweat dripping off him. A final solution came to his head. He should kill himself. Yeah, that's the way. He placed his thumb on the back of the pistol and slid it out of its holster. He panted faster. I can't, I can't. He threw the weapon across the floor, banging against the wall. I've got a better idea. Home for heroes. A feature for patriots. Ooh, military professionalism goes up. Or back to the factory. The work isn't done. You should rebuild. Ooh. I like the future for Patriots. I like that one, but I think I might go with the work isn't done. Back to the factory probably is probably where we want it. Needs a reliable head. Ab efficiency, though. Two to four. What is this one? Huh. English character. English wisdom. The old guard. True to form. This one looks really cool. A hand in embracing. I shall triumph. Uh, of state of the BPP. The British people's party has been divided ever since its creation. Whether they be true followers of the Duce or the Fuhrer, pragmatists and collaborators, or someone of their own kin, they have always existed since the Kriegsmarine first arrived in British shores. In the times of darkness, factions rise. For Britain, there are now clouds above its lands. It's now time for Britain to choose its fate. Whether that is one of the baseline of the current, one of reform and change, or something of its own unique breed. My final words. It's only 23%, which is actually pretty good. Uh, no one received a boost, that's good. Resistance leader Maxwell Knight stood nailed to an execution post. The warm blood drained out of his wrists and poured onto the wooden post. His bloodshot eyes glanced back to the door and opened slightly, and the interrogator came in. They both stared at each other for a moment, then looked down to the military baton the interrogator held. Now, I was tired of the song and dance the collaborators put him through. Being a veteran of the Great War made you experience things nobody wants to. It was too late, however. He needed one last goodbye, something to truly show the collaborators what they were truly worth. The dirt on the bottom of the shoe. He created the perfect lie and stuck with it. The man approached Knight, tightening the grip around the weapon. Do you have anything to say, you cunt? Knight sighed, but the man struck him in the stomach, forcing out some blood from his throat. The man shouted Knight to speak up, complying. He responded, his voice a mere rest. Please, a name. I can give you a name. Please. You won't have anything good to say to spit it out, you filthy snake. He regenerated his voice after a solid minute of panting. There's a man, a mole, one of them, he coughed. His name is Joyce. William Joyce. What? He's a reliable head. Frankly, every attempt by the PPP's ideologues uh, to ape German fascism and simply made them look like fools. And so only served as a part of the cause of the uprising. Had the British people been assured that the government would be ruled by pragmatic Democrats, many would remain loyal and not join the traitors. More now than ever, as we recover from the devastation, the uprising is wrought. We need government of pragmatists, not raving fanatics. Leadership and legacy, more and more these days. Now he found himself within time, in the evening, just to think. He left the problems to let the problems of Britain face, face uh, fade away until it was just him and his thoughts, unburdened by the colossal weight of the responsibilities his offices bore. Well, for his, for a little while, longer at least, he knew he was a temporary PM. He had known that since his first day in power, but now King was content with this, and his mind turned to those who would succeed him. Fontaine had proven his opponents in the Lords wrong during the uprising, whereas before they simply regarded him as a bag of hot wind, they now looked at him with respect and fear. Under him, British fascism will burn brighter than ever, scorching its elements or its enemies, as it leads Britain down a revolutionary path, but what form will that revolution take? But there was doubters in the Commons that he was able and as effective as he claimed to be, with the survival of the British economy being down on him and his cause alone. Under him, Britain would turn away from fascism, for good, and said sailing down an older route one of the pragmatic paternalistic governments, but which port would it finally sail into? What of the future held, Nile King was content. History will always remember him as a wartime PM. The men who took the shattered remains of the government and led them to victory against the rebels. He was a prime minister. During one of the most important events in British history, and for that his name and that of his family would be immortal. The Nile Kings would be remembered, and that was enough for him. A Lord's dream come true. Sentencing. All the eyes were on Maxwell Knight. 
The tension in the courtroom was thick enough that it could be cut with a butter knife. The man who orchestrated the uprising just stood there, hands cuffed together, and an expression carefully schooled blank. The job had been entirely for show, as expected. His defense was a paper thin argument. They had acted according to his own apparent misguided ideals, and that he deserved to live with th what he had done. The rest of the trial had been much less fair. Everything from the most inconsequential of lies to the worst of the war crimes committed by the resistance was attributed to him. When those present in court were discussed what they had seen, they claimed that his expression had not changed even slightly as his list of crimes was read aloud to him. Eventually, the time came for him to be called to the stand. Mr. Knight began the bar register. Walking confidently across the floor, your crimes have already been made evident to the jury. Your guilt is self-admitted. So tell me, now that you know that you have done your, what you have done to your country, what do you have to say for yourself? A bee passed, and Knight stroked his chin thoughtfully. The words do not come easily, I must say. What does a condemned man have to say to his condemners? My fate was determined the moment I was captured, but since you are also keen to hear what I have to say, and I know that everything I say will be recorded, so I, to the men running the new government, I say this. He leaned forward, looking to the prosecutor dead in the eye. I've worked amongst you for years. I know everything about you, your deepest secrets, and your worst nightmares, and I know how utterly venal and black in your souls are. Each and every one of you Nazi-loving dudes is a traitor to this country. You feel Britain and her people, and while I may be long dead before your house of cards falls in on itself, the day will come. Former head of MI5 leaned back towards in his chair, a vicious smile, a viscous smile on his face. Oh, and it will come, burn in hell. He was sentenced to death later that day. I'll bring a helping hand. Well, Britain's, well, we are clearly the sensible choice for Britain's future. We must not sit on our hands and simply expect the people and party to support us. Our supporters must convince them of our merits and offer a helping hand, financial or otherwise, to potential backers whose interests have been harmed by the uprising but have not yet chosen a faction to support. With death comes absolution. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I tell you, I would not or never betray his majesty. Please, no, God, no. I'm not ready to die. Please, no. Or I'm not ready. The sound of a trap door uh, opening abruptly sounds William Joyce's screams echoing all the way to the cell in which now was being kept. He smiled grimly. At least one good thing had come of this. Lord Haha was one of the persons of the world who would definitely be better off with that. That was for certain. If only been salient enough to name a few more of those pigs when he started stretching across the rack. When he was stretched across the rack, but beggars cannot choose to be beggars. Yeah. Uh, his cell door swung open, his light flung into the cell. Two guards stood at the entrance, and Knight knew his time had come. It's a time already, gentlemen, he asked, getting up and allowing them to tie his hands together. Now, I suppose it wasn't too late to plan a daring escape. Perhaps he could try and, and incapacitate the guards before making a break for it, but that wasn't his purpose at this point, so he instead allowed them to walk him across the courtyard, which we should have read this earlier, I guess. There was quite the crowd that had gathered. Many faces suited men jeered at Knight as he walked past, and he glanced impassively at them. They would get what was coming to them one day as he stepped into the gallows to get help but remember, reminisce on how he got there. Uh, those early days as a midshipman in the Navy to the infiltration of the fascist team. As time is ahead of the MI5, the uprising failure, perhaps. One uh, would day, someone would succeed where he had failed. As a news titan around his neck, Maxwell Knight stared out into the crowd of uh, executors. He breathed and spoke his last words, God save the Queen. A long-awaited Prime Minister. Britain is often led by men with grand dreams and grander desires. Men with eyes greater than their stomachs, men who failed, men who got us rots into ruin. It falls before us, uh, it falls before upon the man who once preserved Britain upon the failures of these men to now lead it into a new age. No more shall we be faced with the prospects of grand dreams leading our nation unto a precipice from which it cannot return. Rob Butler leads us now, a man of iron will and unshakable vision. With him at the helm, Britain may at last be freed from the shackles of incompetency, from those blinded by ideology and imbecility. Britain will prevail, else it has all been for nothing. The safest bed of the many things Butler was doing to amass support for his eventual leadership bid for the BPP, having tea on the House of Lords Terrace was by far one of the more pleasant ones. Though the stakes were as high as ever, it was far calmer atmosphere than the riotous uh, commons of the tribal BPP headquarters. Nothing but tea, biscuits, and a vital front in the war for Britain's soul. Look, Mr. Butler, a lot of us would quite frankly prefer you to win over that glorified thug of Fontaine, but you must admit that many of the proposed reforms could make, have made us uneasy. Uh, must you strip our powers in such a way? One of the lords present asked, a leader in the moderate faction Butler had courted if he wanted to win once Domville kicked the bucket. Huh. I recognize that you all may have some trepidation about my proposed reforms, but please, my lords, they are vital to restoring your people's trust in us and faith in Parliament. You will still have the powers of delay and amendment, and whilst not as strong as an outright veto, you're still powerful and more than enough to check the commons if they do something stupid, as quite a few of my fellow MPs will, so often will do. The joke went down well with the lords who seemed to be warming up to the Butler's idea. Seeing his opportunity to secure the support and turn them against Fontaine for good. Bullet struck whilst the iron was hot. Do take, for instance, some of the proposals brought forth by some of Fontaine's gang recently. That bean fellow sounds almost like a communist in his rhetoric. Now that the others sound less moronic, mind you, the other's fellow Ham was going on about the need for a syndicalist economy too, with quite alarming implications for a social status quo. Lord's nodded in agreement, with a peer who spoke before raising his voice again. I think I speak for all of us when I say that it is better to give away some power to decent chaps than risk it all in some unpredictable louts. Very well, Mr. Butler, you have our support. The art of civil politics is not dead. Back to the factory. 
Ye armed men to win a war, certainly it is remarkably difficult with armed dogs and armed cats, yet there's a rather poignant downside to the use of draft men as an army. Namely, they were probably doing a rather large number of useful things before we drafted them, and since they have been undertaking the boring but necessary drudgery that is factory work, our economy has been suffering rather, well, acutely. Well, more than it already was, thanks to the Civil War, of course. We'll need to demobilize them, of course, promise them their pensions, and offer treatment for those worse injuries, and generally do whatever is necessary to get their rear ends back onto the factory floor. Britain won't be worth much of its economy's creator into the bloody ground now, will it? Progress and Prosperity. And that concludes the Treasurer's Report. We've managed to stop the bleeding from the de facto total collapse of our economy and are ready to begin our path to recovery. We're still in dire straits, however, and our economic position remains dangerously precarious. Butler finished his report to Nalaf Kane. With an earnest plea, one which soon crafted to him a glimmer of hope on the look of that genuine interest forming in the Prime Minister's face. I see, thank you for telling me how it is, Butler. First, I'm sure that my eyes firmly on our fiscal state following this report. Nalaf Kane replied, turning over page after page of Butler's detailed report with growing concern but also resolving to fix his mess. The report had been brutally honest and left Nalaf Kane no, to no illusions as to Britain's fragile state. It's my view and that of the Treasury, that we need carefully consider a balanced economic program to stimulate growth and recover our broken infrastructure by courting investment from our packed outlaws. It's a lot of support from within the BPP, but some of our colleagues have other economic ideas, ones which I, in my capacity as Chancellor, must strongly advise against. No, okay, and sighs, he leaned back into his chair. You don't have to tell me twice. Some of the things that, that Bean Chap has been proposing sound almost communist, and hand Ugh, oh, the man would crash a pound if he ever touched the door of number 11. Maneuvering to exploit, expertly to exploit this rare opportunity to court Nalcane's Kane's favor. Butler sees his chance, Prime Minister. Our economy cannot be allowed to falter in the years to come. If it does, then we'll have another uprising in our hands, and as long as I'm a member of this government, I'll not allow that to happen. The PM nodded. Butler's economic plan had been endorsed. Now all he had to do was convince the commons. The economy first and last. The work isn't done. We've come back from the precipice of destruction, yet our work still carries on. All across Britain, homes, factories, and schools lie in smoldering ruins. Millions now live without basic necessities such as food, water, or shelter. Or even more lack employment with their former workplaces now resembling piles of ash and rubble. It is no question that we can allow a return to normalcy within, with England in the shape. We must put our soldiers back to work, reconstructing our homes before allowing full demobilization. Complain if they will, Britain must be rebuilt one brick at a time. You shall rebuild. British soldiers have proven have a proven track record as a cream of our society. Uh, from the Crimean War to the fight against the terrorist uprising, while pains us to continue laying burdens on their shoulders, they must be tasked with rebuilding efforts, bringing our shattered infrastructure, industry, and housing back to pre-uprising levels. Huh, yay. Homesick. Brigadier Tommy Edwards, carried a crate of debris into his arms, placing it on the tailgate of his truck. He slammed the lid. He turned back to the border town of Exeter. The squad had been ordered to rebuild every street every day for hours. He might be more impassive about it than the others, but he was still not a fan. Carrying large boxes and fixing walls were all mind-numbingly boring to the Brigadier. He just wanted to go back home, but perhaps he thought he could still make something out of this. He decided to take a break, feeling the sweat drip off his neck. Seating himself upon the sidewalk, he pulled out his rations for the day. George Lowry, his fellow squad mate and what would be called his best friend here, followed him without anything to eat. Scrunching up against the brigadier, George asked his friend with a simple question, Hey, Tom, what are you doing? Brigadier Edwards glanced back to his friend. Well, George, I don't know just yet. I know this is the quickest way to get the job done. I just don't want to be the one to do it. And I'm hungry, so we took a bite out of the turkey slice, slice lining the inner sandwich. You aren't alone able to do anything, but together, Tommy, we'll be able to do great. After all, if we don't help, we'll never be in a better place. You can either pick up your hammer or sit here, sit there like an arse and watch us all do the heavy lifting. Looking away, Tom opened up more than he had it to anybody in a long time. George, I just want to see my family again. I haven't seen them either back, seen any of them in ages. I'm afraid when I get back, that, that when I get back, it'll be too late. Tommy said before, you know, I haven't realized this before, but George, you got my dad's name. Andy Marshall Law. Last year has been a short pile of crap for everyone involved. Families have been torn apart, brother has turned upon brother, lives have been overwhelmed and overturned, and I'll have to pick up the pieces. Uh, uh, one thing is for certain that we can take solace in, however, is that the fact that the resistance is finally well and truly crushed, uh, for the better or for worse. Britain's future has been decided. And as the shell husks of buildings are replaced with new ones, people begin to walk again with the streets without fear of being bombed, or we can say that life is slowly but surely returning to normal. The only task that remains for us is to give the order to the army to formally end martial law. Only then can we finally put the ghosts of the past behind us and continue onwards into the future unimpeded. 65, huh? Cool. Still not great economy. Ugh. It's pretty garbage, but we have overcome. The Prime Minister slowly walked over the podium across 10 Downing Street. He stared at the wave of people surrounding his street, the street. With it being one of the biggest announcements of his life, he was scared anything could happen. The reconstruction process might have been well underway, but the resistance forces were still out there. The remaining forces, if given the right opportunity, could raise hell. He shook the feeling off, refusing to give the thought of the benefit of the doubt. 
and began the most momentous speech of his life. All my fellow people of Britain, we have managed over the past few months a crushing uprising that did nothing but throw this nation into the fires of despair. I must send my condolences to all the families that had to face the perils of war as we experienced them collectively, but in the end we have overcome it. And I must keep this brief to spare the time of millions, but we have come farther than I could have ever imagined, and we as a people have rebuilt. We made ourselves stronger than any man alone could have done. And I must announce with great pleasure from all parties involved, martial law across Britain will cease 24 hours from the current time. Upon hearing this, the crowd went wild, for when the noise dimmed again, he continued, With the completion of such a momentous accomplishment of defeating the rebellion against us, I have served my purpose as Prime Minister, and as such I will be stepping down in the coming weeks. I cannot announce the day currently before the leniency of time, but the British People's Party must soon find a new leader. Home of the legacy as Prime Minister will be defined by this moment, as I open up Britain back to its peaceful state. I wish all of you the best of days, and have a good afternoon for the end of an era. And that's got his gun. If only they could see us now. It is my hope that we can pull all this behind us soon, Your Majesty, that with time we can strive to make the true chaos and death of this uprising a distant memory. Edward couldn't say that he felt surprised to have Rap Butler sitting in Buckingham Palace, um, staring at him expectantly. He knew the man well enough to have known Butler would make his way to Prime Minister sooner or later. No, what Edward had never expected was that to be using uh, such a small tea room in place of the palace's antechamber. He could still barely remember himself, bring himself to remember, or to look at the wreckage communist bombs had re reduced it to. Whatever he saw, no matter how he tried to force their faces away, all he could see were the damned unfair faces of his father and brother scowling and accusing him. Your Majesty, Butler continued cautiously, interrupting the king's thoughts. Edward shook his head, forcibly reminding himself of the words he knew by rote now. In that case, I would be pleased, as your sovereign, to invite you to form a government, Mr. Butler. Butler opened his mouth, ready to express his thanks before being cut off, and asked a question, moreover, though a personal sort. Butler gave a confused glance at that. Of course, Your Majesty, I'll strive to answer as well as I can. Edward glanced out the window, great skies, rain, and nothing else. You and I have something in common, Mr. Butler. What did this entire country force on us both for a very long time? Do you think that they will understand that one day? That they'll ever stop judging us unfairly? Butler hesitated before replying, I believe they will, Your Majesty. It might take many years in the benefit of hindsight, but I believe that one day pretending our people shall understand. And yet my word my government will work tirelessly to make sure of it. The words were some sort of comfort. Yet that night the king slept as poorly as ever. His Majesty the King has asked me to form a government, and I've accepted. From day one of this new government, every facet of our power shall be channeled towards bettering the, the British people in our greatest need. Rab Butler appointed as PM. Look at that. I look so happy. Wow, look at this. The Three Musketeers, huh? Angus Maud, Reginald Maudling, Harold Wilson, three men that are Britain, and Rab Butler's greatest help. Between the three of them, they carry the acumen and political connections and reform of zeal to keep their mentor's vision for a new United Kingdom alive. It was a game more comfortable with their newly acquired power and unspoken for writing change since becoming over them. The ideological differences become clearer every day, and their old alliances breaking down in favor of new ones designed to give them each their own independent power base. Butler may have saved Britain, but the divides in his own factions seem fit to tear it apart anew should he give up power. But Rab Butler appointed PM. Change since becoming the British Isles as Rab Butler, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, have been appointed the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom following the resignation of his predecessor Ronald Nal Kane, second Baron Brockett. A long-serving member of the several BPP governments, Butler's ascent demonstrated the triumph of the pro-democratic pragmatist wing of the BPP with several liberal reforms having already been announced. Promising to restore British democracy and return to prosperity to the Isle, Butler has been met with an cautious enthusiasm from much of the previously apathetic populace. However, rumors abound that Butler does not intend to occupy Downing Street for long. Many now look to Butler's chief ministers, Reginald Maudling and Howard Wilson, and their greatly contrasting visions to see what the future may hold for Britain. Will Rab's rabble improve anything? Yesterday's man. Rab Butler is a man of contradictions. Despite positioning himself as a reformist, he is less so a man wanting to bring about new change, but a man wanting to bring back the old. Fundamentally, he's still a man of the past, clinging onto the old British tradition of liberal democracy, but the light and vigor that he had held in his younger years has largely been burnt out by both his age and the decades of bargaining with the German mega corporations. His bones ache and his mind's yearn for rest, but God works in mysterious ways, and now the only man that can create anything resembling a bright future for Britain is one that belongs in its past. Cor Coronation Day. After years of service, dedication to the crown and country, Rob Butler's finally triumphed to the old order as he ascends to the position of Prime Minister. With his victory, the pragmatists have taken their place as the dominant shaping force in British politics, a great victory for a reasonable and sensible government. Yet, we have no time for a vein of fruitless celebrations. The British Butler, the Britain Butler now presides over, that's not the Britain of his youth, nor is it the same nation it was just three years ago. Her wounds are cut, are deep, cut by German invasion and made deeper by the turmoil of the uprising. To heal such wounds will take time and effort. And then we can talk about the Butler cabinet. Extra food supply, economic ruin, of course, and an altered line, god dang it. Say that, Oh, what is this? Increases our GDP by 0%. Oh, well, isn't that fantastic? Uh, the Prime Minister and his Chancellor shall create the budget of 64 to the House. There will always be in England. 
Uh, many believe that the noblest one thing one can do is to fight and die for one's beliefs. While well, this is not without merit, it's perhaps even braver to tuck those beliefs away for the sake of something greater, no matter how painful it may be. David Lloyd George was the man who did this, the first prime minister after a sea line ravaged the country. He stepped in after having uh, occupied Downing Street during the First World War. Uh, the man was undoubtedly one of the best men of the century, however, even he was only human. Despite his best efforts, Lloyd George could not stop the fascists from entering government and wearing down Britain's institutions with their corrosive touch, but he may rest well, however. Rob Butler will continue his legacy and will ensure that his, all his work was for nothing. It was not for nothing. There always been in England. For two decades, England has been run by fascists in his own right. Don Blow is a capable statesman that did the best he could given the circumstances, but it was surrounded by lunatics. Fascist Cretans and frothing ideologues seeking to drive everything we hold dear into the abyss, but nevertheless, Britain has persevered, England has persevered. And now that was a truly stable government, with a brain and a heart this time is in power. Britain can finally begin to heal. Railways have been bombed, the kitchen has been scarred, and our people are still at each other's throats. Under the leadership of the pragmatists, we can finally get back on track. But the cabinet, if you want to this, please go ahead. Better have loved and lost. The second that Rab Butler stepped through the familiar Downing Street archway, he was bombarded with applause, questions, and congratu congratulations. BPP strategists and secretaries swarmed him, competing for his time with questions of some petty and some vital. He nodded graciously and said his thanks, he shook hands. He traded jokes and he gave orders. By the time he was done, the crowd of well wishers had thinned and he was left with ones that truly needed his attention. I had a, pr a perilous journey for that brought us here, and I would like to thank you all for for what you have done in the struggle that led us here, he said. Though there will be reorganizations and great changes in the coming days, the work we you have all done will never be forgotten. A smattering of tepid applause met his remarks. While well, several other attendees no doubt wondering which of them would be reorganized. With that, he withdrew into the study along with Nal Kane's personal secretary. Ten minutes later, Nal Kane's personal secretary had been made aware, in no uncertain terms, who was the first reorganization would be. As he left, Butler pulled out a folder full of draft proposals from Angus and began to read. He'd be busy all day, he knew, even busier than he'd been as chancellor, but it was a good sort of busy. The story realized with the start that it kept them from thinking of Sydney. Ever since he lost her four years ago, she always haunted his thoughts like an unwelcome ghost. Whether there was cabinet meetings, bill drafts, or yelling matches in the commons, most days he would get s see something small, be reminded of her, and fall into gloomy thoughts over the first days together at Cambridge. Oh, that lovely day. They spent together in Vancouver when he learned William M Mitchell was stepping aside as MP, and he first stepped into politics by replacing him, blissfully ignorant of where that would lead. He had all gone almost all day without thinking of her. He would always love her, but always. But she would haunt his days no longer. Double take. Closer clubs will arrest their affiliates, investigate their paper trials, the enemy within so long in the ascent can now be finally stamped out. Now that the smoke has begun to clear, we can finally address something we should have done a long time ago. The fascists were always unsteady allies, a collection of unthinking grunts and souls careerists. They're useful idiots at best and have actively detrimental to the nation's health at worst. And now that we find ourselves in Downing Street with a hefty majority, they seem much less friendly than they did before. While well, they can cry all they wish, they can leave the party, complain to their German friends, and decry us as Bolshevik puppets all they want. At the end of the day, we are the wheat and they are the chaff. The only downside to this is that we were not able to do this earlier. Bluster and split, spit. The Right Honorable Andrew Fontaine, MP for Southwest Norfolk, rose from his seat in the House of Commons following the direction to the Speaker and took to the floor. His burning gaze scoured the nearly empty building and glowered. The few MPs that had bothered to show up even barely formed a quorum, and not a single member of the cabinet was there. Mr. Speaker, it is with a heavy heart that I must give today's speech, but it is a needed one. The government of the Right Honorable Prime Minister is weak. It is the government of degeneracy. This government seeks to, to return our sceptered out to when we were at our weakest, a time when Britain was destroyed by the weakness of her own people. Even now, the memory of what those degenerates seek to do unto to Britain looms large over us. Lest we forget that only a few months ago, traitors seeking to restore this failure of a system had risen up across the isle. Yet this government wishes to appease these traitors, these scoundrels. This government wishes to return to the weakness that destroyed us, the time when we were under the control of Jewish banking. Well, that is a, is a desire of this government, I proclaim here that we loyal few will stand for Albion until the very end. As the speech ended, Fontaine noted that only the few scattered ideologues within the chamber showed even the barest hint of support, and the speaker yawned as he sat down. He has no effect in the face of cold, hard numbers. The most faithful of friends. Angus, welcome to the Exchequer. I'm sure you need a little advice on part regarding the practicalities of governance, as you are just as experienced in these matters as I am. However, one thing I would uh, always, uh, always advise is that the day-to-day -day pressures, the day -to -day pressures of this job must not be taken too seriously. You have a great responsibility, to be sure, but spending your time worrying over it will help to absolutely help nobody. I'm afraid that you have a great deal of work that must be done, especially the lamentable mishandling of the economy under the previous governments. Feel free to stop in to ask any questions you need, and don't be afraid to ask your new subordinates for help either. We're about to see the nation transform under our leadership, and we must be more skillful now than we ever were in the past. I have little else to add, my friend, aside from the fact that I will be looking forward to seeing you at the soonest possible amount. Regards, Richard Austin Butler. There's a warm smile, and a chuckle long during the middle of a smoke before being followed away. A report decades in the making. 
first published in 1942. The Beveridge Report has remained a cornerstone for many pragmatists and the Partisans Foundation. Authors by Liberal MP William Beveridge and his wife, the report concludes that the foundation of a welfare state was necessary so that Britain may be freed from the many social ills she faces. Whilst Lord George's government has implemented some of the measures recommended by the report, the fascist slothing in the government quickly ignored it. Now they once again hold the helms of the government, many junior members or ministers are calling for us to once again turn to the report as an answer to our current economic woes. The uh, party man's plea to Mr. Harold Wilson. I congratulate you and the Prime Minister on your recent appointment to His Majesty's government. I hope you receive this letter in good health and with his high spirits for the challenges to come. My greatest wish for this new government is that you will follow through with your promise to implement the universal health care coverage uh, for all Britons. It's an initiative that both, you, both of us have championed in the House of Commons for years. Were it not for the obstructions of the old guard, a generation of decent citizens would have no need to suffer the predations of profit-seeking health care providers and the debt their services incur. Nevertheless, I remain concerned about the other initiatives that you and the Prime Minister have been proposing. The British People's Party was meant to promote the public health and wealth for the British people. Initiatives such as these, rec those recommended in the Beveridge Report advance this noble goal. Beyond this, your attempts to insert politics into people's homes and lives and lives under the guise of democratization and brings risk, uh, risks bringing the fractious conflict our singular holistic party was meant to end. It's our role to meet the needs of the British people without burdening them with the further need to engage in the political sphere. I fear that Butler's wounds will reopen the old wounds of divisive partisanship we were meant to resolve. I hope you consider these words with the importance they deserve, and I implore you to contact me should you wish to discuss these matters in further detail. Regards, Ben Green, the Common Sense Budget. As I'm sure you all agree, Mr. Prime Minister, the pound needs to have a floating exchange rate. This is absolutely imperative for our overall economic recovery, especially after years of failed fascist eco economic policies and the uprising damage to the economy so much. Butler, who was listening to this Chancellor of Exchequer and nodding throughout, responded immediately with, I do agree, indeed agree, Angus, but we need to consider how the Germans would react to this. We need to cut some sort of deal with them, or else it will stop us from doing it. I'll speak to Reggie about the, on our options for it, as he understands the way the German corporations think far better than either of us. Maud nodded his agreement. While trying to hide his distaste for modeling and his uh, shadowy dealings with the Reich and its corporations. This will obviously result in a great deal of initial inflation, which I will counteract by starting a massive program of council proper, property purchasing. We also need to get rid of the wartime price controls. They served their purpose to as tasteful as it was during the uprising, but now they're a complete burden to our economy and they're causing widespread shortages of virtually, virtually everything. After Maud had finished, Butler finally responded with, You've been reading my mind throughout, Angus. I don't really have anything further to add to that, because it is exactly the plan I would have proposed in your place. All we need to see now is it is its announcement and implementation. I returned economic sanity to you? The ideologues implant. Dear Reggie, well done on your appointment to this position. Though we have been on opposing sides for the last few months, I can take some assault that your lot will implement some sorely needed changes to Britain. Many of your government's policies are what I would have proposed Ryan Butler's shoes, so long as Britain remains in the hands of those whose eyes can look forward to, towards the future, I can live with it. All that being said, I must urge you to temper your pragmatic concerns with a clear-eyed hope for what this country's future ought to be. You, Butler, you've handled the tale, and it's your responsibility to steer the ship of state. I hope that on your voyage, you don't destroy what defines Britain with any rash change of course. Should you need the advice of an accomplished home secretary, my door is open to you. Best of luck, Andrew Fontaine. Double take. Since the establishment of the new government after war, several political oddities that would otherwise never make it near governance have been given a chance to increase their influence well beyond what it should be. None pr represent this quite as succinctly as Gerard Wallop. In the past year or so, the lore as we previously written off as an ailing fool has become perhaps one of our greatest threats. To move forward with our agenda, we have to deal with Wallop and quickly. He will marshal his resources to oppose us every step of the way if he is allowed to continue acting unhindered. To rid him of his power, we must first cripple the lords, and doing so will finally reserve or reverse the mistake Lloyd George made two decades ago. For the opening salvo some time ago, since the repeat of the 1910 is all but inevitable. Oh, deficit went up. Not good. Cat facts. Butler saw Wilson enter the room with a frown. That was expected. A sign of some conflict an older knew that would have to mediate. Modeling frown, no. Butler blinked. And when he saw confusion on his face, Mr. Wilson modeling asked, Just what the heck have you got on your face? This? Wilson ran a finger with a fresh scratch on his chin. Nothing to bother you with, Mr. Modeling. Now open this briefcase on the table. Uh, regarding the latest proposal from you haven't been in a fight, have you? Butler meant honestly, but Wilson's deep in frown suggested a lack of appreciation for that concern. Very well, if you must know, it's that mangy little cat of yours, Peter. Peter scratched you? Butler's jaw slackened in the slight horror, modeling snorted, covering his mouth to suppress his giggle, but we know her to be a sweetheart. Besides, what were you doing with Peter in the first place? Wilson sighed, rubbing the bridge of his nose. Mary wanted to see the new chief masseur, and she insisted on bringing Nemo along. God knows why, but in a few minutes, the two were in a bloody great row. He tried to ignore the tittering that escaped modeling's grip. Mary was screaming, the cats were screaming. I tried to pull Peter off Nemo, and the little bugger clipped me on the face. I'll tell you, that monster was out of control. Nemo might have the se sepsis. And would you stop bloody laughing, Mr. Modeling? Modeling cackled like a broken engine, doubling over into the table. Wilson gritted his teeth, eyes narrow, brow furrowed. Butler, with the same mental picture of a fluster, Wilson trying to pull away his squabbling cats, forced himself to wipe the smirk from his face. Okay, Reggie, that's enough. We have business to discuss. To banish want. 
So, replace low pensions with moderate pensions. The Prime Minister and his Chancellor shall overhaul the Byzantine pension system as his first step towards public service reform. Banish disease. Healthcare improves. The Prime Minister shall make an, uh, establishing a national health service his government primary mandate. We will spend more money. I don't want to spend more money. Let's go with this. To banish disease. Just because this can be literally everybody right now, this is okay, but... On the third day the came the frost, and when the frost comes death, winter's creeping hands draw near, and a single fact is clear. The people of Britain cannot survive another winter with the state our medical system is in. Our healthcare system should do just that care for the sick, the injured, the weak. Yet what does our current system do? It acts as just another arm of the MI5. No, Britain is better than that. Britain is greater than that. As part of the new policies, we must introduce a true health care system of service for all Britain. From the lowest family to the highest peer, all will have access to affordable care. Not a single life will be lost to the winter's claws this year, not a butler has anything to do with it. Firefighters of Whitehall. Butler surveyed the team uh, surrounding him at the conference table, feeling a note of approving pride. He just as well as subordinates, he knew, Bennings and Chisholm, or Chisholm, were as reliable as party webs could be, and as far as reliability went, Angus, Wilson, and Reggie needed no introduction. As instructed, none of the men had brought pen or paper, and no clerk stood by near. Uh, to take the minute of minutes of the meeting. If any of his ministers seemed surprised by the cloak and dagger nature of the meeting, none of their faces showed it. I believe we all know why we're here, he began, being greeted by a sea of nods and then smiles. Uh, Mr. Fontaine's ideologues are quite bluntly a presence that we can no longer tolerate within the party. I trust that I can decline to elaborate on why, after all of your many experiences with them. Some of you have offered solutions to this, Reggie. Modeling's toothy, toothy grin could have passed for that of a shark. He nodded, whistling yesterday. It seems Fontaine's la pet lapdog and favorite MP, the Honorable John Bean, is nasty taste in contractors. We will trust surveyors to the Thames Airport, implicated in corruption charges, back to his office. Not that I think he ever met them, but the press, well, uh, press has a way of not caring about things like that. He let out a hearty guff guffle. Angus frowned his forehead, seeming even larger for the expression. That could work. Finances are something of a weak point for them. I've had the revenue office start looking into black shirt clubs. There's potential there, sir. Budgets that could be slashed, property taxes left unpaid, nothing on the fountain himself yet, but give us time. Father Hum, bet Reggie's plan first. Then Angus says, Wilson, you know that Silver Stern's better than anyone else. You'll start there. I want to report from you on reorganization as soon as possible. Bennings, Chisholm, or Chish Chisholm. I'll leave, I'll leave keeping the party in line with you. God willing, this fire is one we can put up quickly. The old guard's omen. Mr. Original Modeling. I received the news of your appointment to the cabinet with great concern for the future of this country. I've long been an opponent of the destructive nature of the finance capital and those who control it. In light of your history on the Board of Trade, your appointment risks returning Britain to their grasp and that they might once again poison our land and souls. Any formal protest on your expected conduct will fall in deaf ears, therefore. I shall leave you with the following warning, though I suspect you will not heed it. The House of Lords uh, will defend the honor and dignity of England should be threatened by the Commons. Ger Gerard Wallop, 9th Earl of Portsmouth, 9th Viscount Limington, 9th Baron Wallop, Bailiff of Burley, New Forest. It seems a careless chuckle before... It received a careless chuckle before being set alight. Cutting the weakest link. No comment, no comment. Bean's mantra was as hollow. <clears throat> Oh, uh, as he felt, racing the press that lapped at his heels. The scent of scandal has stuck to him, and these animals pursued such fragrances to the ends of the earth. They followed him from his front door to his car, from his home to his minster, from his car door to the front steps, uh, uh, barking and snapping the herring and all throughout. Once the doors of Westminster closed shut, Ben let a long, pained exhale. But scandal still clung to him, and like everyone else inside, kept being at arm's length. When he walked through the corridor, civil servants nervously stepped away from him, and MP side eyed him as he walked out by. Nobody looked at him if they could help it. Bitterly, as Bean approached his office, he wondered how long this would last and how humiliating it would be. And Bean walked through the channel now with the ghosts themselves part before him in embarrassment. There's no reports on his desk, no letters or memos, only today's papers from the Daily Mail with an unflattering image of him on its front page. Amply implicated in Airport Row, or Wart. Ludicrous. He wasn't even involved in that nonsense. He just signed a few papers. He didn't even meet the surveyors. That was bloody... The phone rang, shanking Bean out of the spitty. He picked it up and slammed it back down on the receiver. There was a few seconds of peace. Before it rang again, he picked it up and slammed it back down on the third ring and tore the cord out of the receiver and let out a faint cry. Above him, uh, Bean, or Butler, stared at the front page of the Daily Mail with a devilish grin. The first of many moves in this game. And he set the paper down and picked up the ringing phone. Ah, morning, ah, Maud. Bloody good job with the mail did, didn't they? Now about the next step, the first move against the ideologues. The faithful secretary. At the end of the violence that disrupted our country, it is this government's intent to restore dignity and prosperity to Britain. We have been invested with the power to complete the sacred task, and I intend to exercise this power with honor, dedication to a party and king, and never... Ah, oh, king and party might work better here. Rachel Phillips pen hovered over the offending section. Nobody wants to accuse you of being a Republican. Good point, said Harold Wilson. Phillips crossed it out, wrote in her substitute. Expecting Wilson to continue, she looked up and found him staring outside his window. Beneath the gray sky and row of plain trees, he saw taxi cabs dropping off shambling suits. A couple rested on a bench between pl plinths on which they were once statues. A policeman marched along his daily rounds while a whistle around his neck and a truncheon in his hand. Why stay? Hmm? 
Philip saw a shadow over Wilson's face, sitting her pen on her notebook. You could have followed your husband back to Germany. It might have been a bloody awful, but you could have. Why did you anchor yourself to a lifeless Britain? There's a reason why he's my ex-husband. A flicker of wince brushed Wilson's face. He turned away to hide his brief embarrassment, but I'm attached to England, warts and all. I've never been able to imagine living anywhere else, and besides, there's another reason. When Wilson looked back at Phillips, there was quite a determination beneath her polite smile. I don't think Britain's entirely helpless, because I know you'll be Prime Minister one day, Harold. Price worth paying. Well, I was starting to feel the beginnings of a headache coming on, when Reggie and Wilson had come to him in a rare moment of unity to present their proposal for a national health service. He should have known it was too good to be true. Any joy gone from the two men setting aside their endless verbal sniping had evaporated the moment Angus heard the details of the proposal. It's not the principle I uh, disagree with, Prime Minister. God knows I don't, said Maud, jumping his finger at the document for emphasis. But we don't have the money for it, and that's a fact. Unless Mr. Wilson here wants to conjure it out of thin air, we're making promises to the public here that we simply can't keep. The men glared uh, baefully at Wilson. Wilson's lip twitched. If Mr. Maud were to carefully review the proposal again, you'll see that the numbers do actually add up. I can promise you that Mr. Maudling and I made absolutely sure of that, even if we have to borrow to offset the costs. By going to Germania and Zurich with a begging bowl and asking for change, exploded Maud. Just how many strings do you think that'll come with, Wilson? Have you thought about that at all? Has Maudling? Borrowing in the short term only, Wilson replied smoothly, and if Angus here wants to go out on the streets and explain public health is something we simply lack the money for, he's welcome to. I'm sure they're very, they'll be very sympathetic. After all, the last two winners we've been through. You think I don't care, you smog? Thank you both, said Butler, raising a hand and cutting Maud off. Angus, I understand your concerns and sharing them. Borrowing them, borrowing will come with a price, and I hope that you trust I am not blind to the risks. But Mr. Wilson is correct. If we're to have any hope at all of surviving another winter, there are risks we'll have to take. Mr. Wilson, and for Mr. Modeling, he's going to Zurich. The pitch. And now on BBC One, the Prime Minister with an important address to the country. The churn. Ooh. Civil service par partification will be removed from our sort of laws. In theory, the civil service should be the backbone of our state, managing the finer points of governance without any serious political leaning. In practice, however, it is very different. Demands from across the channel mandated a so-called Aryan civil service, essentially leaving it in the pockets of the Germans and the mega corporations. In order to take free Britain from this overt outside influence, we must remove these Aryan practices from the civil service. Thankfully, we have an out. As a man who knows the ins and outs of the bureaucracy, Harold Wilson has been advocating for the removal for a long time. Together, Butler and Wilson will make the British civil service just that. British. The undying vines. It makes sense. It shouldn't have happened. It was supposed to be impossible, and yet no matter how many times he reread the paper, searching desperately for any mistake anywhere, nothing would change the contents of the paper Rap Butler had been staring at for the past hour now. Over 100 MPs have been backed has backed neither himself nor Fountain, but a third man whose political prospects Butler believed had been incinerated along with the Domville. But there was a little photo enclosed in the reports to really hammer in the danger this man posed by a helpful civil servant. Gerard, Gerard Wallop, the Earl of Portsmouth. I was not alone, of course. No. Oh, no. That would be too easy. Wallop had always been one of the old guards in the BPP, one of those sickening, simpering traitors who grinned ear to ear when Jack Woods marched across London. Butler watched as their influence slowly waned over the years. Hastings, Russell, the Duke of Bedford, was a relic of a distant age. A.K. Chesterton, that thuggish brute, had seen his own base ripped out from under him by Fontaine, and Donville was now a permanent resident of Downing Street. They should have collapsed into obscurity by now, but the weeds had persisted and threatened the garden like never before. Fontaine's ranting and raving in the Commons was an annoyance for certain, but he was powerless against Butler's majority. A majority that meant as much as a petition to men like Wallop, and whilst the Commons was lost to him, Lords was anything but. Wallop's power needed to be broken. He and the old fascists in the BPP were a clear minority in the Lords, but the most active peers who could have opposed them were across the ocean in Canada, leaving the upper house free to be co-opted for their own agenda. The Parliament Act would fix all this, but at first it had to be passed, and to do that, Wallop had to be defeated. The fate of the democracy depended upon it. Fresh blood. The Prime Minister of task former Minister of Labour to strike the Earl of Portsmouth in his most vital region? Familiar bones. The Prime Minister keeping his cards close to his chest shall consult all options available via the Foreign Secretary. Powerful fool is a useful fool nonetheless. Starting immediately, weekly audiences between the Prime Minister and the Director of General MI5 will be arranged until hitherto to unspecified date. Pitch. Let's do this one. Change is frightening, and our new government will be the one for, known for change. It will almost be unilaterally be for the better. The British people do not need any more unwelcome surprises. For too long, they've only had lies and betrayal from their government, and following the chaos of the uprising, it was well past due for us to make amends. The Prime Minister himself will formally make an announcement via radio and television detailing his ministry's plans. Show the people that the government is both willing to communicate and ready for help. I have some comments from the last episode set, or included. Now things are getting good. Now who won the German Civil War? Albert Speer did. Uh, so it says, Twilight of the Anthropocene. Demo finally came out. Are you planning on trying it out? Yeah, we'll see, maybe. Uh, someone says, wow, so romantic. Someone sh should write a fan fiction about this. So it says, an eternal rest for the soldiers of Himmler. They'll get their chance for revenge when Himmler path is released. And someone says, the traitors who try to get Pretender on the throne fail. Now, 
The battered British nation rises in order to rebuild, but the pragmatists have their own vision for Britain. One which may conflict with the party, but we'll see as we probably finish out the rest of this uh, short little campaign with the rest of these focuses in the next episode. I apologize for not doing it all in one episode. I just do not have the time at the time of this recording. But if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll probably most likely finish out the campaign. Maybe. We'll see. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.